Hello, my name is Alex Isles, and today we are going to be doing an interview with Alex Harvey, who is a master's archaeology student at the University of York studying medieval archaeology, specializing in the Viking colonies within the Atlantic Ocean. And so today I was thought I'd bring him in to chat about Viking York, but then also if we spill out into the Atlantic colonies, that's going to be amazing as well. So welcome today, Alex. <laughs> Um, as always, if everyone, if you've watched the channel for the while, you'll know that I've got my camera in one place and my screen in another place. So if you ever see me looking over, I'm just looking at Alex on my screen and it's not that I'm not trying to look at you. So just welcome today, Alex. And uh, what better way to start than maybe starting off chatting about the great heathen host or the great Viking army that obviously took over southern Northumbria and created the kingdom of Jorvik and settled in the area. So just to start off with, uh, what's your sort of view on the settlement of the, the Scandinavians into the area which we today now call Yorkshire? Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. My oh, camera brother. is right in front of me. <laughs> so I will uh, try and keep looking forward. Uh, as for the great heathen army establishing Jorvik, uh, because it might not have originally been called that at the time, perhaps. Mm. Um, so that's an event that happens. There's a partition of the great heathen army or the Great House, as the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles call it. Uh, this occurs in about, I believe it's 874 or 875 AD. I probably should have looked up before coming on. But you get a split of the Great Army. Uh, Guthrum leads what we now call the Great Summer Army um, down into Wessex. That's really um, the classic events of King Alfred the Great's guerrilla campaign. Um, but Halfdan Ragnarsson, who may or may not be a real figure, you've always got to be wary with the Ragnarssons, um, he takes a good chunk of the army up north, uh, fights the uh, Britons in Strathclyde. And there's a mention in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle of the men of Haftan sharing the land and ploughing it between themselves. But the actual takeover of York uh, occurs roughly 10 years before that, um, a year after the great heathen army arrived in England in 866 AD. Uh, we have on record of the two warring kings of Northumbria who made an uneasy truce at the time. Uh, Ayla and Osbert are both killed either in York or outside and then there's an attempted um, takeover back from the um, invading army that's unsuccessful. So from about 866 AD you've got a, a heavy Scandinavian military presence in York and it goes from what you'd sort of stereotypically call Anglo-Saxon Aofa witch to Viking Jorvik which is all over York Nowadays, that's all uh, anyone knows. Yeah, that's so how that's, it begins. That's one of the things I find sort of really in interesting because you've got Eofil, which, which I've always been pro pronouncing uh, slightly differently. So it's good to actually hear it out loud. But um, when you've got that, obviously, York's history is fantastic because it starts off, I believe, in around 70 AD as like the Roman settlement of Eberacum, then becomes Eforwich. And then later on, we have this name Jorvik, which comes mm. out of somewhere. And then obviously the Normans slowly change that into York as we know it today. Yeah. So it's got that stages of history that we nice and neatly dish up and go, OK, there we have Roman York, we have Anglo-Saxon York, we have Viking York, and then we have obviously Norman and early English Nor York as we know it today. And so the, when you... et the etymology there of the name of Anglo-Saxon York, if you consider it in two parts, you've got one as Aofa, um, which probably comes from Boar, like place of the Boars. Mm. There may have been a significant Boar population there, um, or at least in North Yorkshire. And then Wick, or Witch, um, which is typically associated with trading parts or emporium that are next to either rivers or the coast. So London Wick and Hamwick, Quentovich as well in um, modern day Belgium. That's a good example. And then, of course, the offer which. So these are all part of a trade network before the um, Scandinavians get there. Yeah, because there's Anglo-Saxon York and then just slightly up, I, I think it's upriver. There's a Frisian settlement just outside the walls, at least I know in the medieval period uh, from my memory. But uh, you've got these trading settlements that are all connecting in together 
to a much larger trading network in the North Sea Basin, uh, which is obviously going from, you know, even sometimes as far away as Brittany, all the way mm. right round to Denmark, Norway, uh, Scotland, and obviously the Atlantic Islands as well, and then into the Irish Sea. So it's not as if today, when we think of motorways and roads and all of that stuff, that's how we get around. Maybe if people were going to the continent today, you've got the Channel Tunnel or you take a ferry, something I've done recently, I went and took the ferry from Newcastle across to the Netherlands. And so you've got all of these connecting lines where people are going across um, by very modern routes, whereas back then, obviously, the, the motorways is the sea, and that's how it all connects together, which gives obviously, uh, well, first of all, Anglo-Saxon York and then obviously Scandinavian York its significance. And so um, one of the things that I really noticed you say there was that it may not have been called Jorvik initially. And that was something that I thought was really interesting because obviously everyone thinks of, oh, Jorvik, that's that's the name of York. And it wouldn't have been an instantaneous transformation. No, course, it would have no. been from um, generations on, similar to how language these days change. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned the Frisian settlements outside York. Uh, there's two that come to the top of my mind that are in Yorkshire. There's a one free stop and phrase stop, which I know is near Bridlington on the um, east coast. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, really, before the Scandinavians are opening up Eofowich to the wider trade networks beyond the immediate North Sea area, uh, you could consider the Frisians, which um, for those of you who don't know, it's modern day Netherlands, the low countries, basically. You can consider the Frisians as the master sailors. Um, if you want to use such a term, before you get the stereotypical Viking Age longships dominating the North Sea. Uh, there's a, a few coin hoards um, with coins minted at mints across Frisia. Uh, one such would be uh, Dorstad. There's a few coins from there found in Elfowich in recent excavations around the Coppergate area, and these predate any sort of Scandinavian presence at least any significant Scandinavian presence, because they were probably trading there prior to 866 AD when you get the great heathen army invading. So it's all connected, which yeah. is the main and, thing. And that's the, sort of the cool thing as well, because when you've got those interconnections, obviously, you, you know, you're thinking, well, someone's bringing in goods, they're sort of trading, they're establishing things. Traders also bring prestige to local kings. You know, we don't really know much about you know, um, Ospert and um, and Ella, those two sort of kings who are lost into history because we don't know if they're members of the previous Northumbrian dynasty of, you know, the Idings or if they're just opportunists or local power hungry leaders. We don't know if they're related to the kings, well, the, the, the royal house of Yorkshire or Deria, which obviously was a previous royal house before the, um, the Northumbrian dynasty of Ida then comes and puts its power on. But these guys would have had a very much a vested interest in York and it's wanting it to become this local powerhouse where they would get benefit of money and all of that sort of stuff. And when they have these coins, the really interesting thing is, is um, and again, because I work a lot from books and I haven't yet done my academic study, but the, the Frisians are the ones who create the skeet, aren't they? The, the penny that the silver little silver penny that becomes very popular throughout the whole of the it's, North Sea. It's very sea. much modeled on the um, yeah. North Sea designs, yeah. So because of that, you see that come across into what would become the Northumbrian coinage. And then you have those influences which would then connect together that North Sea basin. So when people think of the great heathen host or the great, <clears throat> the great army that comes across, these are guys settling in the region. They may have done multiple trade trips to the area or known of what would have become York later on without necessarily having invaded before. And I always love the fact to know that the great heathen host started off settled in the Netherlands, well, so not settled, but they used the Netherlands as their base of operations, as the land uh, to then invade into what would become Viking Yorkshire. It wasn't like directly across from Denmark. It wasn't from Norway. It was from those areas of that, yeah. that area. So Even when, when you look at geographically a modern atlas, East Anglia, which is the, uh, quote unquote, first landing point of the Great mm. Heathen Army is literally a day's sail um, from the Netherlands. And while we can't 100 percent prove that the Netherlands was used as, say, the one launch pad to England, we definitely know there's a significant Scandinavian raider presence in Frisia um, near enough at that same uh, period of the Great Heathen Army invasion. 
it's actually at its peak, um, Scandinavian presence in Frisia, that is, around the 860s, so pretty much um, contemporary with the Great Heathen Army invasion. You've got individuals like um, Rorik of Dorstad, who is one of the first major examples of a Viking being given land benefices by a uh, local ruler in order to prevent further raids. And at least the Carolingian annals, which is modern day France and Germany, um, they describe him as quite repeatedly year after year, um, say, for instance, agreeing with Louis II to, yeah, I'll stop raiding. And then the year after, there are raids on his brother's kingdom because it's technically not raiding in um, Louis II's kingdom. Yep. It's, say, Lothar's. I, I, I could get those uh, names wrong because I haven't read the annals of St. Bertan in literally since my undergraduate. Um, but the, uh, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, one version actually describes some of the leaders of the Great Heathen Army as a uh, Dux Frescorum, which uh, translates to Frisian Duke. Mm. So it's possible um, some significant players of the Great Heathen Army are, for lack of a, an official term, big names in the North Sea area, and they are known about in England that they have some power in Frisia. So, so yeah, the areas even before the Viking Age are significantly connected. And, and you mention that the, the individuals in the Great Heathen Army, um, and I think we're still debating year after year the size of this host. Don Hadley and Julian Richards probably know better than anyone. Um, but they would have known about the significance of the Alpha Witch prior to invasion. And indeed, that goes for the entire Viking Age. Um, these English emporia, so Hamwich, Eofwich, Londonwick, mm -hmm. and a plethora of other places, they're already populous international trading centres long before Lindisfarne. So it is pretty much guaranteed you're, you're going to have some Scandinavian presence trading in these areas uh, long before, um, you know, your average Joe goes, let's raid Lindisfarne in 793 AD and start the Viking Age. Exactly. So yeah, it's all, it's all sort of ties together. And there's so many other little bits and bobs that also connect into it because you'd have had a relatively shared language within the North Sea Basin where there was understandings between the two dialects. I think there's been some studies between, as I've, we've mentioned before, Frisian and Anglo-Saxon, that they were pretty much like almost understandable with just mild accent dis dis sorry, differences. On top of that as well between Danish and Anglo-Saxon like again some words were different but you could communicate quite easily and then Norwegian was I think and sort of Norwegian and Swedish were the slightly more different ones with more words that were different but there was still that ability where probably about three quarters of the language was understandable enough that you could communicate between each other and still be able to have this sort of like um this movement of people. So when we imagine this great, this great army coming across, the great army coming across into southern Northumbria, creating the kingdom of Jorvik, it's you know first of all multi, multi ethnic. You know you've got people who have been under the influence of the Carolingian Franks, some people who have come from southern or from Denmark, some people who may have come from as far away as Norway, but it's less likely at this point. And then oh, you've also got people who are Frisian and all of that sort of groups of people all coming together. They come in, then they start settling. And when they start settling, you know, they, they can become a part of the local population quite quickly. And they've already, from their homelands, got influences as well. It's not as if these people came across with a very strong um, culture that they were then enforcing onto the local people. Let's say like the Normans later on in 1066, They've got a very strong sense of who they are, even though later on, obviously, the Normans intermingle and it's actually later on the Plantagenets who make the real French changes, if you like, compared to the, um, the Normans who were still very, when I use the word plastic, I mean, like, impressionable and mm, you can see that, yeah, malleable, like Henry I when he marries into Anglo-Saxon dynasties and, you know, his son is described as the, the prince who could was almost described as Anglo-Saxon in his culture and the Normans didn't like him much. Um, but the, the, the Scandinavians in this sort of period in the sort of the ninth, ninth century seem very malleable, very like willing to become a part of the local culture. And, you know, I think there's plenty of studies being done on the fact that the Scandinavian religion 
you know, many people obviously in things like Vikings and TV shows like that, they, they almost depict as a very solid um, monolithic faith. Mm -hmm. Whereas actually it would have differed village to village. Burial practices are different across the whole of Scandinavia. Especially in fragmented yeah. areas like Norway and Sweden, where mm -hmm. population movements are entirely dependent on the traversability of land and fjords. So in Sweden, large areas are inaccessible. Um, because of huge forests and the lakes, especially in the north of Sweden. And in Norway, um, if you're not traveling via boat, um, it's going to take a while. <laughs> and, and you've got a really sort of unique, um, I use the word culture, but maybe mm. they're not so homogenous at the time, in areas like Jamtland, which is the mountains between Norway and Sweden. They're not connected to the fjords, um, not much anyway. So really sort of unique regional identities. And of course, you get the different sorts of what nowadays we'd call the Viking religion. But back then it may have been just, it, well, it probably didn't have an official name. It would have been, uh, I've, I've seen variations on what we call a Viking religion. Uh, Odinism is a term I quite like because that separates it from the earlier Germanic pantheon, which has similar gods like Wotan and Thunor which is cost the etymological roots of the Norse gods. Yeah. You start to get the unique things like Odin with his one eye and the ravens that really sort of um, appears before the Viking age, but it separates it from the Germanic roots. That's slightly off topic, but I guess it does segue into what you were talking about, which is the shared language of the North Sea Basin. Uh, it's because they all go back to the Germanic roots of the migration period. Frisia, again, plays a huge role in the migration period. It really plays a huge role in this entire period, Frisia. It's, um, as um, a few recent scholars have coined it, it's a liminal zone. So it's it could be seen as no man's land, but also every man's land, because it's right in the middle of Denmark, England. It's on the border of the Carolingian Empire, and it's um, below Norway. And in the middle of that is the North Sea, which, like you said earlier, very helpfully is a motorway of all these different cultures crisscrossing. Um, and segueing from language, if we go back to Eofwich, um, pre-Great Heathen Army and Northumbrian, you mentioned that King Osbert and Ayla may have been may have had a vested interest in York. We don't know, for instance, if they are uh, of the same dynasty as Ida from the um, sixth century, or if they're just power-hungry nobles. Um, but Northumbria. Um, quite uh, sort of accessible scholars. They like to group the Anglo-Saxon heptarchy and all the other sub-kingdoms, which is what England was made up, were made up of at the time. The power struggles between these um, seven plus many other kingdoms uh, changes over the three centuries prior to the Viking Age. So to begin with, uh, Kent's really quite a big powerhouse. That's like the first powerhouse. Then Northumbria has its heyday in the 600s. Um, and then it's Mercy's time under King Offa, especially, but also his predecessor. And then um, just before the Great Heathen Army invasion, that's when Wessex starts to uh, annex its neighbours, Kent as one example. And Mercia becomes really subservient to Wessex just before the Great Heathen Army arrival. So Northumbria by that time, I read something in Geoffrey Hinley's The Anglo-Saxons, which is a really accessible, good overview of the period, um, that Northumbria while it had been uh, united between, like you mentioned, uh, the two kingdoms of Deria or Deira, and then further north, I suppose uh, in your area, Bernicia, mm -hmm. which is north of the River Tees, these were two independent kingdoms and they become united, for lack of a better word, as Northumbria, north of the Humber. And there's three main academic figures writing during this time. You've got um, Bede, Alcuin of York, and I guess he wasn't writing, but Cuthbert plays a um, strong role. And that is in part why the Anglo-Saxon language becomes so dominating after the Great Heathen Army uh, invades. Because there are the shared Germanic roots between, say, Danish and Anglo-Saxon. But it's also because Eofowich was a powerhouse of learning you're getting loads of uh, manuscripts published there on vellum and sheepskin, and these are being shipped to the Carolingian Empire, 
under Alcuin of York and others. Um, Bede's History of the English is written in part uh, in Eofowich, quite possibly. So there's a really big scholarly presence in Northumbria, all stemming from Eofowich and the associated monasteries. And that might have had, um, Jeffrey Hinley states, the, the Christian church may have actually been ruling Northumbria, for lack of a better word, over the kings themselves just before the great heathen army gets there. So I may have gone on a tangent there, but that is at least connected to language and the uh, dominating factor of the uh, Anglo-Saxon language, as we'd call it today. And it yeah. all comes from Eofwich as a place of education. And it may have been burned by the uh, great heathen army. But again, that could come from, uh, like you said before the interview began, actually, of the bias of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle written, of course, in Wessex, so they like to hype up the negative impacts of the uh, great army and indeed any Viking force um, and downplaying the perhaps more peaceful element. This is a sort of thing as well, because it all ties in together from what we were saying. So if you've got the sort of the malleability of the, the Scandinavian faith versus a very like strong like understanding of what the Christian faith is, and then when you think of the great heathen army, they're going to have influences from the Carolingian Empire, one of the big Christian states and powerhouses of Europe. They've now got the Christian kingdoms of England. Well, the different uh, states which now exist within England um, with oral Christians. So they have that influence on them as well. You've got a large academic community of monks and priests who are then, as you say, going across into the North Sea. And then the pressures of like kings basically trying to get influence over, you know, Frisia, Denmark, other places like that. And later on, Anglo-Saxon missionaries went across to, to Norway. And obviously there was a big sort of like battle of faith over Denmark between German missionaries and Anglo-Saxon ministry missionaries to see who would convert the Danes to Christianity in the 10th and early 11th centuries. And so you see that and obviously the Germans and in the end are the ones who win out, whereas the Anglo-Saxons focus a wee bit more on Norway. And so that all comes together to form, you know, this, the, how the, the Anglo-Saxon church is then coming out and having that influence. So yeah, I would have no problem in thinking that the Northumbrian kings in, do apologize, sorry, in the ninth century could have been quite subservient to the church um, due to the fact that, you know, you've got this, the fact that the church in York is gonna be the big power and later on, even though we can see like coins are minted in the names of the Archbishop of York, you know, the, they, they are the ones who mint the coins in that area. And then later on, Scandinavian kings have sort of joint coinage with the, the Archbishops of York. So there's mm. that deal that they're working together. And also other Scandinavian kings, it's uh, Guthrum, Guthrum, isn't it? Who, yeah, Guthrum becomes Athelstan. And in I know, sorry, I, I Guthrum. It's, sorry, Guthred. the other one. Guthred, sorry. Guthred. As you can understand, it's easy to get the two mixed up, but Guthred... Yeah, they're, they're right after each other as well. Yeah, Guthred is one of the other Scandinavians who becomes a king of Northumbria, and he then puts on his, his role and creates what would later become the, um, the, the land of St. Cuthbert, or the later on County Durham, as we know it today. By, by basically giving land to the community of St. Cuthbert, which some people have seen as like a, a neutering of Northumbria by giving lots of its really fertile, good land to the church. But also, it could also be seen as a buffer state between Benicia in the north, which still has a lot of power, a lot of influence, and is still quite heavily populated. Um, today, we think of Northumbria as lightly populated, but that's because of the Anglo-Scottish Wars where like uh, later on people like Robert the Bruce came through and reduced the population by 100,000 people, um, which we're going from 130,000 to 27,000 is a heck of an experience in I think uh, uh, under 10 years of warfare. So when we've got that going on, Benicia is still hugely populated, hugely influential for that period. You create a buffer state with the bishopship of, of York. So again, using a religious power so the, so the bishopship of uh, County Durham of uh, the community of St. Cuthbert, and then you come into the Scandinavian community of what is today Yorkshire, which again still is having heavy influence from that. And so you can understand why the Scandinavians with a more malleable religion would have chosen to convert and amalgamate to be a part of this very 
wealthy and very interconnected community, at least in the ninth century. And then obviously, um, as you go into the 10th, it's the later part of the 10th century when we start seeing the conflict with the uh, the, the, the Irish, uh, any Irish Scandinavians or the uh, Hiberno Norse being kicked out of Dublin and ending up over there again. So that's where you get these, this new conflict where a new culture is then put on top of the, uh, the Anglo-Scandinavians who seem to really have amalgamated. Um, just before we were starting, you said how the material culture within like 20 to 50 years within York was very much similar to the rest of, well, was Anglo-Saxon Anglo -Saxon England or would you like to go into that a wee bit more? So it's a good segue actually, because I, you've reminded me that I was gonna talk about two things. Mm. Um, so you mentioned there that um, you've got the pragmatism um, which is, I suppose, is a really good word to describe stereotypical Vikings, very pragmatic. Um, at the end of the day, it's all about profiteering. Um, pop culture nowadays, especially the TV show Vikings, really guilty of this, portrays them as religious zealots just going around destroying churches in the name of pagan religion, as opposed to just nicking wealth because wealth is extremely important to you know, earn fame and reputation and pay men. But if it is easier to earn fame, reputation and wealth by converting to a local religion, they'll happily do that. Um, there's a form of, I guess the term wouldn't be proto-baptism, but it's sort of like a half baptism. Um, I'm gonna butcher the pronunciation, but I believe it's called like pre primo signing, something like that, which is, it's a really common practice between Scandinavian war bands and the Anglo-Saxons where they will half baptize the leader ah, so that at a, at a is, later point he will get a full baptism. Is this the point where he keeps his arm out the water with the sword or am I mistaking that with something else? It could That could be um, a symbolic example. So like it's okay. not a full baptism because you're not giving away your entire... Your entire self to God, but mm. it's it's sort of like a promise that at a later point you will, and you get a lot of instances where, especially in the tenth um, century, where war leaders will on their deathbed convert to Christianity fully, because twenty five years beforehand they did a, um, I, I really forgotten the spelling of the word. It's something like primo signing or prim primo signing. It's in Latin, yeah. uh, but anyway. As far as the material record goes, there is evidence of the uh, quite a sudden transition from uh, Scandinavian presence coming in and then the local Christian community in Northumbria, maybe perhaps educating first generation or second generation migrants. The best um, example that comes to mind is the Gosforth Cross, um, mm -hmm. which is a stone cross, four panels, four sided rather, which blends the story of uh, Ragnarok with Christian theology. So you've got images that allude to Christ and the Genesis story with images of Fenrir and serpent battling one another and the doom of the gods. And we think, or rather scholars who are not me think, I do agree with them, um, that it could have been an educational method to teach perhaps Scandinavian children about the local faith um, by blending in these elements that they would be familiar with from their homeland and saying, you know, we're quite similar. Um, in the Yorkshire Museum, there is a example of a tombstone that blends the myth of Sigurd the dragon slayer uh, fighting Fafnir, but it, it was uh, found in a Christian graveyard. So already you've got these what could be argued to be heavily pagan beliefs, but in Christian context. Because at the end of the day, the goal of the church is to convert more people. So there is less of a precedent for violence and less of that otherism. And then meanwhile, the Scandinavian raiders are trying to get a bit of that dollar, ka -ching. so converting is in their best interest of course it might not always be as cynical as that but the chronicles can't really be trusted when it comes to conversion because they really play up like the religious elements um 
when in reality it was probably a lot more human. It wasn't um, wasn't so much uh, Guthrum, like like you mentioned earlier, is one day an Odinist, and then the next day he has a vision and suddenly he's Christian. It, it's probably a number of factors, like he can retain some degree of his power if he converts or at least appears to convert to Christianity and stops yeah. um, perhaps discriminating against Christians. So yeah, just in just in North Yorkshire, around Eof, which you get that immediate, and I say immediate, I mean like 25 to 50 years after the invasion um, of the conversion. And I think it's really interesting as well, because it's like, I often think that when you look at stuff like the Gospel of Cross, like the, the myths and legends, as, you, as we've already mentioned, the, the faith back in Scandinavia is very uh, malleable. It depends each region, stuff like that. So you'll have your core elements of the, the stories that are passed around when you have the traveling uh, skulls, uh, mm. traveling and passing the stories between each village. But then like each village will have its own customs, stuff that will go back to early animism, local peoples, all of the change like that. And the stories are built up from local heroes. And so I often think that when we're looking at stuff like the Gospel of Cross, people in the past have tried to view it in the same way as they view like modern monotheistic faiths like Christianity, Judaism, Islam, where you're looking at um, a, a faith that has a book whereas these are oral faiths that are passed down yeah. and so i often think that like stuff when you're looking at ragnarok it's not like looking at the book of revelation within the bible instead it's kind of like a marvel film you know <laughs> yeah. it's you know it's it's a well, story it in 2017 it was it was yeah they didn't do a very good job of telling it sadly mm. but that's another matter entirely <laughs> but the idea of like um it's it's the thing you sit down and you tell your kids as entertainment it's um it's a bringing together of the whole family and it explains elements of the world around and um another good example i always like is earlier on we've got uh this is going right back to the fifth and fifth century ad the irish monks when they're going out to convert the picts and it's um columba saint columba um mm. has uh a, it deals with a giant serpent that comes out of one of the locks and when he deals with this serpent you know everyone's always trying to figure out oh where's the serpent that sort of stuff but often serpents when they're mentioned are symbols of the devil you know you look yeah. at this story of saint george and saint george versus the dragon dragons are also examples of the devil so when we've got that i don't see a problem of stuff like images of you know great the great world serpent or fenrir and stuff like that because they could have easily gone, well, these are images of evil, these are images of the devil, you know, and obviously then that sanctifies in some ways for, sanctifies Odin, you know, Odin becomes more of a king, and then later on, you know, they are very much um, cleaned when um, we look at the 13th, it's the 13th century uh, Icelandic sagas, where when you've got the 13th century Icelandic sagas, you know, um, it, they make this, this sort of suggestion, Odin, was actually like a man these were great heroes who were semi-deified and that's, mm -hmm. that's how they depict them within the Icelandic sagas so and there's also the question of like when we're looking at these uh, you know beliefs and stuff like that how much do these people view them as gods and how much did they view them almost like the Romans viewed Hercules these great heroes who became gods or were, were like sort of semi-magical because there's even suggestion that the Scandinavian gods have gods um, yes, yeah, yeah. Because mm, there's there's temples in Asgard in yeah. the poetic Edda. So we, yeah, they never describe what they do in said temples, but yeah. it that it's one of the, yeah you're right it's it's one of the few world or historical belief systems that on record ha may have something above it. It's fun fact you mentioned Marvel actually because I believe they worked that into some element of the comics the fact that there's a tier above odin and the boys yeah but moving away from religion because obviously that's one really yeah, key yeah. element of the blending and evolution from the danish presence to perhaps anglo-scandinavian is the idea of the transition from kings of northumbria to kings of just jarvik mm. so guthred is a bit of a transition figure. So I believe he is described as a king of Northumbria. Whether or not he is in question is, of course, 
completely up for debate. You had a big Anglo-Saxon stronghold in Bamba, which I, I don't imagine would have, you know, necessarily um, bent the knee um, to an mm. interloper, foreign interloper. But, uh, of course, these things we're likely to never know. But later, after you get the after nine seventeen AD, um, I guess you could call it the second wave of Vikings in York. Um, at this time, it was probably Sven called Jorvik. Forkbeard and uh, his son Knut. No, so that's a little later. That's yeah. um, that's that's really late. Century. Oh, sorry, that's sorry. That's from about nine eighty five A.D. onwards. Apologies, so that's, I got that's my dates mixed up. Unified, yeah. well, one hundred percent unified, pretty much. Yeah. Um, nine seventeen A.D. This is when you start to get the Hiberno Norse. Um, yeah. So they're expelled from Dublin, as they are a few times, only to come back later. And that forces the east coast of, say, modern-day Lancashire and Cumbria. They become hotspots of Viking raids. And this, of course, then impacts Jorvik. So you get individuals like um, Olaf Quran. Oh, I might be mispronouncing it again, apologies. And, of course, the most famous is Eric Bloodaxe, um, who allegedly is of Norwegian royalty. He's one of the sons of the... Um, semi-mythical figure Harold um, Tanglehair or later Harold Fairhair. So what you've already got in Jorvik by 917 is a pretty cemented Anglo-Scandinavian presence and this is backed up by material goods like uh, Baltic amber becomes a main import, soapstone or steatite from um, Nordland in Norway uh, or um, the Faroes. Uh, you also get your skates, your combs, telltale signs of Norse activity. Um, but they're not necessarily replacing Anglo-Saxons. And I believe that's um, sort of the difference between the historical and archaeological record here. The historical record would have you believe that in 866 AD, Anglo-Saxon York dies and Viking York appears from the ashes. But really, they're one and the same. And the Scandinavian presence at to me, the main thing that they add is they widen the trade network from just the North Sea area to as far as um, the east, the Baltic Sea, um, at the very least. And then, of course, down the Volga and Nepa to Constantinople. Um, there's even a, an Iranian silk cap that's dated to Viking Age York um, that appears after the Anglo-Saxon context. So that's, um, that's near Caspian Sea area. That's near Baghdad. So again, the, the trade route expands, the trade network expands, and that's owing to the um, Scandinavian, typically Viking longships. They're just far superior to everything else on the market at the time. Um, so they can travel greater distances and bring goods from further afield. So long-winded, but in, by 917 AD, you've got what you'd call an Anglo-Scandinavian Jorvik. That's a big international melting pot of trade, migration, and wealth, significant, um, I guess you'd call it a second city of England if you've got um, Londonwick or Lundin and then um, all of the burrs that um, King Alfred the Great sets up. Yeah. They offer which is a big one, Jorvik, sorry. So then when you get the Norse um, from Ireland, they start invading and conquering and settling we don't really know if they're Christian Vikings or believers in Odinism. To my knowledge, or at least I haven't looked into the material record that they bring along. But they are very much, again, invaders to the locals. And even though the locals at this point will have a heavily Danish presence, you know, they're still, they're no longer the other because yeah. there's a new other that's coming along. And that's where you get the kings of Jorvik. But then they're, they're explicitly not kings of Northumbria. Yeah. Because Northumbria, you could say, goes through a bit of an unofficial split. Bernicia, once again, is its own sort of collection of powerhouses. And Deira, or, or Deria, I could be mispronouncing it, is its own thing. <laughs> to be honest, if you're on this channel enough, then uh, I apologize for my mispronunciation on a regular basis i've got um, a very thick yorkshire accent so i um i really butcher a lot of old words and especially foreign words 
well, I got Derry, uh, uh, sorry, um, wrong. And then I had someone in the comment section go to absolute town, just like, you've got it wrong because in the Latin, if it has to rhyme with this. So, that, you know, the words of uh, Gregory the Great make sense because uh, he was in the slave markets and uh, he comes across these Anglians from Derry, which I've probably just sent wrong. But basically, it sounds like uh, damnation in Latin. All right. And so it's like, uh, these are angles from Derio, and he goes, no, they, they are angels. And, and then the idea is that he saves them from damnation and sends okay. Apollinus uh, and the, uh, sorry, the early missionaries across and converts then first Kent and then from there. So trust me, mispronunciation, <laughs> I am working on it. It's a work in process. And then hopefully, you know, 10, 20 years time, I'll be saying it all perfectly. But uh, until then, I learn new words on a daily basis and it's all good fun. That's the fun of learning. Aye. But sorry, but, uh, please the, continue. The um, the difference, I guess, between the great heathen host occupying mm. York and the later Norse Viking war bands, Hiberno Norse, sorry, they're probably significantly smaller. So it's less of a decent population moving into a offer which where uh, as it is elites with unique material culture moving over so again the the sort of conversion to christianity relatively remains unaltered there's a lot of um i guess you could call it propaganda in the anglo-saxon chronicle and charters from the day that talk about northumbria is really lawless and this extends way into the 11th century as Northumbria is a bit of a lawless evil brother of all the other provinces that's why there's so many rebellions especially when Hadrada invades um, Harold Godwinson's brother mm. just goes yeah I'm gonna go on his side sorry mate um, but that, that's relatively unrelated but anyway Northumbria at uh, this period you could argue is I hate to use the word a lawless wasteland because that's just believing the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, but it's definitely nowhere near as a united front as, say, Mercia or Wessex, which have centralised power structures. They've got the burrs, so it's a network of forts. Northumbria doesn't have this until after 927 AD. Um, I believe that's the year yes. where it becomes part of England once again. But then it um, later with Eric Bloodaxe, there's a brief period where it's no longer part of England and then it becomes part of England again upon his death. So really what it reads to me is these Viking kings of Jorvik is sort of the last death throes of attempted takeovers of, of this area of Northumbria. They're no longer like in the semi-legendary Halfdan Ragnarsson's day. They're no longer settling the entirety of Northumbria. It's just... Eric Bloodaxe clinging to a really important trading site. And you mentioned a great point, which is the coins minted by Norse rulers, which have the archbishops on the other side. And that goes back to what I said earlier about the Christian church having huge sway over Northumbria. So they may very well have been the religious power as opposed to the Norse secular power. They probably had more power, I'd go as far as to say. So, yeah, that's pretty much the transition from Erfowitz to Jarvik. Yeah, because it's, again, it's when they're very much the kings of York, it's like they're controlling that. And even later on, when the death of Eric Bloodaxe, he's ambushed in on the way to Cumbria, isn't he? Mm. Um, and yeah, by Marcus, apparently. Yeah. He's, he's betrayed by his um, confidant. Yeah, which is, it just shows how much influence do you actually have or power do you have exactly outside of your own capital city you're able to be ambushed. Um, exactly. So the, the, the sphere of influence, unlike, you know, your half dans and your later on guff, ah, sorry, guff reds. Go, go through it. Yeah, we yeah. go. Hey, it's, the names are hilarious. It, when I was doing the Anglo-Saxon Kings of Northumbria, you're like, you know, going through and you're like, Oswald, Oswi, Oswin. Yeah, Ayla, yeah, Ayla, all good Ayla, Ayla, yeah. Ayla. Um, but yeah, the, uh, so when you've got them, you know, they, they are actually, they probably could have had a greater influence. And there, there's the big question of like, were the Reeves of Bambra actually, or like the Earls of Bambra, those powerful individuals in the North still able to hold that power? 
um, or were they under the kings of Northumbria in York or how did it all look? And everyone puts a lot of sway on over Bamborough Castle, but there must have been other royal royal settlements mm. alongside York. Because like, if you think about it, Bamber is not enough to support a royal household on its own. No. Um, it is with... probable there was something at Dunholm, aka yeah. Durham. Yeah. We know that there's a Norse stronghold there. Um, but a lot of the time, <clears> the Norse strongholds are built atop Anglo-Saxon power, powerhouses, mm. or at least very nearby. Whether or not it was a significant stronghold, or the Norse made it significant, that's all for debate. I don't know too much about the history of Durham other than Durham's Cuthbert. interesting because um, there's in there's Elvet, which is Alfet, and Alfet E is called the Island of Alfet, and so basically. On one side of Durham, there was an Anglo-Saxon settlement there when we know in the 660s, if I'm correct, I'm trying to remember this off the top of my head. Um, in the 660s, there is a, uh, a synod of Northumbrian priests at Elfet. So on Durham itself, the actual peninsula where Durham Cathedral is today, there may not have been a settlement because relying, and again, it's a bit tricky because um it, it sort of erodes into the the power of St Cuthbert if you think there's a settlement there before but uh if you're looking at Simeon of Durham he says there is no like there was a woodland area and then they cut down the trees and built the first chapel and then they built a stone church which then the, the relics and the body of St Cuthbert were transferred into but when they've been doing work underneath the floor of Durham Cathedral putting an under here for the heating system and they did discover Roman pottery. Mm. Now, does that mean there's a Roman settlement there or not? Well, we're not going to be doing any digging there anytime soon uh, because that's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and uh, you don't really dig into a UNESCO World no. Heritage Site unless uh, you want to lose UNESCO World Heritage status, uh, which I think Durham is very keen on keeping. So there, there is probably something up there. There's something around Durham Cathedral. There's the early Anglo-Saxon Minster that's on that site. There's some cool stuff going on there. There's other castles and areas that previously belonged to like Northumbrian princes and then sometimes they're donated to the church and all sorts of stuff like that. And of um, course, there are a lot of the abbeys and monasteries, which they're not perhaps on the same military, well, they're definitely not on the same military level as say Bamba. Yeah, yeah. But they are nevertheless significant cultural powerhouses like Whit Whitby, the synod of Whitby, um, Alice Hildegith, big name, Lindisfarne, Monastery of St. Cuthbert's. Um, and again, it goes back to Northumbria being a really big Christian presence um, in the Anglo-Saxon heptarchy. Well, which, even, um, and I get in trouble for saying this sometimes with my friends who are Scottish. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a British Scot, but I like doing this as a sort of a wee joke, but I always point out that Edinburgh is an English city in Scotland. Um, because like um, obviously it was taken um, by Oswald or Oswede, depending on who you read, um, and then it remained right the way up until the early um, ten sort of I think it's ten oh six when it's officially lost to the Scots around that sort of time uh, between ten oh six and ten eighteen as when it's sort of lost to the Scots. So that for that period you've got four hundred years of it being a part of an Anglian kingdom. So that's another royal estate is up there around Edinburgh. You've got places in Cumbria. So it's all over the place. So when we're looking at it, yeah, you could see that originally the first wave of Scandinavian settlers, they amalgamate themselves into especially the ridings of Yorkshire. They create Yorkshire as we understand it. And then later on, the Cumbrian coast becomes settled by that second wave who were expelled. But up in Benicia, we've got fewer settlements with those Scandinavian place names Obviously, here in Newcastle, we've only got um, we've only got two biker and walker, and uh, biker literally means the settlement on the uh, on the marsh, the village on the marsh, and walker is the settlement on the wall. So, like they they didn't have the best land, but then obviously Tynemouth, even until the early twentieth century, had its own distinct dialect that was influenced by Norwegian. So there's some really cool stuff there where Tynemouth is the major Scandinavian settlement at the mouth of the River Tyne. But we even know when you look at the chronicles like Hafdan uh, actually <clears throat> goes along to a place called Dunstan, which is just uh, in near, well, in Gateshead today, but slightly further up and across the water from Newcastle. Uh, and he settles his army and, or stays over the winter in Dunstan. 
So we, we know where they are and where they're settling. And if he's able to put his army on that settlement, there's enough supplies on the River Tyne to actually supply however large his army is. Yeah, and, and, a, and an army would require a lot. Yeah. Daily. Huge amounts. Because like you know, some people put the Great Heathen Host up to, to 10,000 individuals. Some people say it's 1,000 or less. But if it's 1,000 or less, I'd be su surprised because how do they manage to defeat Northumbria? Uh, it's, whereas, it's clearly more yeah. than previous armies i yeah. think the most significant viking army in england prior to 865 is the one that ethelwolf defeats in 851 at the battle of Aclea, because they're described as having overwintered the year before um but again really sort of depends when certain entries in the anglo-saxon chronicles are written because parts of it are contemporary and you can sort of figure that out by the language they're using but then other parts are written 50 to 100 years after so they are describing events, knowing full well how they end, hmm. which isn't how life works. No, it's uh, convenient and very hmm. useful. <laughs> so I guess clean it all up. Sorry. Now that I mean, us in 2022, we know the beginning, middle, and end of the transition from Anglo-Saxon Eothelwic to Viking Jovic. I guess to summarise, the key things to remember would be that. Anglo-Saxon Eothelwic is already an international trading hub. Mm -hmm. That's in the name. It's already connected to the North Sea and possibly the Irish Sea trading zones, which are two really big European trading zones. Then when the Great Heathen Army displaces the local elite and installs their own figures of power, you get the slow conversion over one to two generations, which is proven in the archaeological record by the Gosforth Cross and other such items. And the Scandinavians, uh, like I said earlier, increase that um, network of trade in both directions. And then like you see throughout the whole of England, not just York and Northumbria, is when Scandinavian uh, migrants settle and they become Anglo-Scandinavian, the next wave of Scandinavian Vikings, they become the enemy. You see this with the Norse Vikings um, from Ireland, the um, Eric Bloodaxe's Norwegian dynasty that come down, which um, may or may not have been as significant as the um, sagas and the skaldic poems say. And then later, like you mentioned earlier, Swain Forkbeard. Swain Forkbeard, especially Canute the Great, when he lands in Gainsborough, he's landing in an area that is pretty much, as a vague figure, probably 60% of Danish descent. Um, so they'll have some affinity there, but they they are still the other coming in. Um, so yeah, it's not what pop culture would have you believe with like the Anglo-Saxon York suddenly Viking York. It's really one constant early medieval trading hub that grows with Scandinavian presence, but remains Christian, I think, throughout, which of course owes to the long and really rich and really interesting Northumbrian history. Alcuin of York, Bede, the big boys, and all of the many, many books that they wrote in Latin and transcribed to English. Yeah. Well, that's meant. Well, thank you so much again for like the time you've given. I know when we started beforehand, we said, oh, about a half an hour, but obviously we've gone a wee bit more than that. But it's, it's been just too class, much, just a too much to discuss. Yeah. Just rambling away through it is half the fun. Um, just at the end, is there anything that you'd particularly like to sort of plug or mention just at the end of the? Um, the interview or um not, not really uh, thanks yeah. thanks for having me it's been very fun to talk about history and archaeology well, I, I, I do this for much. fun daily so <laughs> i'm happy to do it some more no brilliant well what i'll do is i'll just draw it to a close but as always if everyone if you've enjoyed it please do like and subscribe share the videos with your friends if you'd like to support me further obviously you know and down in the description there are the various Patreons and coffee accounts if you would like to, but there's always, there's no pressure whatsoever. And please just go away and keep reading. If you've got any questions, put them down in the comments section. And it's great to have a discussion there because ultimately the whole reason why I do this is so you get to know a wee bit more about history, learn something more and just, just find out where everything came from rather than unfortunately relying on stuff like Vikings or anything like that, which uh, as you'll know from the channel, I have a wee pet peeve for. Have a really great rest of your day and thank you so much for watching. And I look forward to having you in another episode in the near future.